Uh, I have to have a conflict of interest statement, but I don't actually have any conflicts. My job is to do research. We synthesize research. Uh, this is a small portion of the evidence that I'm going to cover. Uh, and other than that, I have no affiliations or partnerships or financial interests. OK, we're going to be talking about pain and recovery. And when we talk about pain and recovery and nutrition, then you have to understand what we're talking about. If you're a personal trainer, you'll, you'll usually get a question about, you know, I've lost weight. Uh, I've gained some muscle, I still have an injury that isn't healing, what do I do? And they'll ask you questions about nutrients, about supplements, about sleep, about everything. So let's say by building strength, losing fat, and just moving better, you can solve about half of pain issues. What about the other half? The other half just keep lingering, and they come up every time you play sports, uh, when you get hurt more often at the gym, and occasionally they just never go away. So. We're going to be talking about that area of people, the people who have pain that doesn't go away. And when they ask you questions, they'll often ask you, hey, does fish oil work? Uh, you know, what about glucosamine? Should I take glucosamine? Those questions are tough to answer because uh, there's no easy way to put this. Pain is a complicated issue, about as complicated as you know, happiness or any other emotion. So when somebody asks you, does fish oil work? Does glucosamine work? It's not qualitatively different than if somebody asked you, hey, uh, you're not happy. Will watching an Adam Sandler movie help you be happy? You know, if I watch Adam Sandler movies, will that, will that help me be happy? We don't know. You know, some people are helped by Adam Sandler movies from before, not necessarily now. And similarly, some people will be helped by fish oil and some by glucosamine, but nobody is lacking fish oil in their diet. Fish oil is not an essential fat. It's a metabolite of an essential fat, but it, in and of itself, is not essential. Nobody's missing glucosamine in their diet. We don't usually eat glucosamine in the food that we eat. So those are just usually temporary Band-Aid therapies, and we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the actual pain. Where did the pain come from? And if we address the root issue of where the pain came from, then potentially we can sustainably solve the problem. So if you've had joint issues, raise your hands, or if you have joint issues now. So pretty common. Have you had clients that have had joint pain issues? Because usually when people go to the gym, often it's to lose weight and to feel better. And one of the things they want to feel better about is joint pain. Uh, so in this setup, we're going to talk about pain and the type of pain that you'll see in your clients. Most people think they have a high pain tolerance. In fact, everybody does. So they'll say, oh, you know, uh, I, uh, I stuck my finger in the car door, but I didn't take any Vicodin because I have a really high pain tolerance. But it'll go down to like, uh, yeah, I got this really deep paper cut, but I don't care. I have really high pain tolerance. There's, there's no link between people's pain tolerance and the injury. It's, if anything, it's a very weak link. Uh, usually, studies that look at MRI results don't have a strong correlation to the level of pain people feel, uh, feel on a scale of 1 to 10. So people's estimation of their pain doesn't relate to the injury. So where is the pain coming from? What is the pain, actually? If the pain isn't in the wrist or in the knee, then where is it? So uh, the reason why I'm talking about uh, pain specifically is, by the way, that's me and where I live. Um, and just, I provide some context. I like cheesecake and cats. But I was a pain researcher for a couple, uh, couple years, back in 2008 to 2010. So that's why I'm talking about pain, because I got to know a little bit about mechanisms of pain and where pain stems from. Um, and I also know pain through surgery um, and failed surgery, so I don't look like that anymore on the left. I don't know if you can tell. I don't, I don't even have a bicep, I think, anymore. But basically what happened is um, I had a bunch of failed surgeries. I'd stopped lifting weights. Um, so I lost a lot of muscle. And I learned about it, a lot about pain because the issues you tend to know a lot about are the ones that affect you. So I researched it as much as I could, and then I got into actual research, uh, like writing papers about it. And along the way, I got more into nutrition, um, and I currently run the website examine.com, which is uh, basically a database of nutrients and supplements, and we just synthesize evidence. So we'll look at um, randomized trials of humans and list out every single one that's been done and what they say. So when you look at all the supplements, when you look at all the factors that affect pain, then there's a ton of them. And no one researcher knows what's most important, because usually a researcher will be interested in their pet issue. So if it's a vitamin D researcher, 
they want to prove that vitamin D helps pain, and that al also subtly influences the way that they, that they structure the language for their abstract and conclusion. So really, you have to step back and look at all the factors. Does anybody know what the 80-20 rule is? This is kind of a trick question. Anybody want to volunteer an answer? Nobody? Yep. Yep, that's exactly it. So usually people answer, uh, like you can eat, you can cheat 20% of the time if you eat healthy 80% of the time or something. No, the 80-20 rule is the Pareto principle. It's an old economic principle. Um, it applies to both behavior and macroeconomics, so how economies and industries run. 20% of the factors usually drive a large chunk, like 80% of the output. So when you think about acute pain, chronic pain, recovery, then we're trying to find the 20%. And when you look at the 20%, then you have to differentiate the symptom of pain from the other things that are happening with pain. So often, pain is coupled with depression, a lack of sleep, and a lack of social life. And there's more stress. So we really have to hone in on what's actually causing the pain. And it becomes really complicated. It's Like I said, it's as complicated as happiness. If there's thousands of things that can cause happiness, there's an equal number of things that can cause pain. So just you know, taking a pill of fish oil, like a little bit of the f uh, oil from a fish, that's not going to do anything for somebody who's had chronic pain issues, most likely. The reasons we have pain are different than the reasons why animals have pain. So uh, does anybody have a dog, a dog or a cat uh, that's had an injury? So when a dog or a cat or a deer or anybody, uh, any animal has an injury, then they basically hide away. You know, they, they avoid contact with their injured limb. Uh, they, they try to make sure they don't get more hurt, and they sleep as much as possible. What humans do is they go to the doctor. Uh, what does the doctor usually say if you go in with pain? Uh, there's three things usually that they'll recommend or prescribe. Any guesses? Anti-inflammatory, that's one. Second? Physical therapy slash rest. And third one is cortisone shot, which is just a more locally applied anti-inflammatory. But there's issues with that. So uh, you don't have to know much about the research to know that a lot of injuries, especially after two to four weeks, are not inflammatory in nature. It's uh, tendinosis, not tendinitis. So once somebody comes to you and they say that they have a lingering injury, unless it's actively swelling, there's probably not a lot of active inflammation going on. So when an animal has pain, usually inflammation is resolved quicker, and they don't seek out pain relief as much as we do. And that's actually known through studies, because if you feed a rat or you know, a dog or a deer two uh, chows, one standard chow, their standard food that they eat, and one that has some Vicodin or something in it, you know that the animal is still in pain if they eat the chow with Vicodin, because otherwise they don't choose that. They don't get as much of a high as humans do. So we know approximately when humans versus animals stop feeling that pain and start acting normal. And humans goes on this far, and animals tends to go this far. So why is that? It's because we're humans. We rely on our big brains, uh, and our big brains are our weapon. Animals' weapons are running away really fast, uh, having claws, having fangs, having thick hides. We don't have any of that. So we use our brains to hunt or gather, and we get that food, and then we protect ourselves. So that big brain is great for that, but it's bad because it predisposes us to chronic pain. Because we can make a lot of connections that aren't there when we get hurt. Like, I'm hurt. Will I ever be able to bench again? Do I have to do flies for the rest of my life as prehab? Uh, you know, is this going to hurt every day for the rest of my life? Animals, researchers think, don't feel that. So when we feel pain, usually there's one of three strategies that people employ. The first one is that anti-inflammatory strategy. The doctor says, uh, cortisone shot, anti-inflammatory pill, or physical therapy. And that's trying to extinguish the fire of the inflammation if it is there. The second step is all that stuff failed, we need to do more stuff. So that's like surgery. Uh, that's like a nerve block, and there's a lot of other things that you get basically at a pain clinic or a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor. The third strategy is none of those things work, so you just sleep and cry and, you know, you never solve your pain. Um, and that's usually when conditions like fibromyalgia or other more mysterious conditions pop up. And for a long time, 
physicians thought that those conditions were histrionic. So usually if there's a condition that is not quantified, there isn't a biomarker for it, then at first physicians and scientists will think it's, it's not true, it's not a real condition. And for a long time, uh, multiple sclerosis was seen as a histrionic condition of women age 40 to 50, um, you know, who were depressed because they were home alone while their husbands were out working. And the same was thought of fibromyalgia, but now it's known that there is a chemical link. Uh, one of the chemicals is something called substance P, P for pain, uh, that's found in higher levels in the spinal cords and nervous tissue of people that have fibromyalgia. So it's a real condition. Uh, all these conditions have developing research, but the main point is that there's more pain every year, and it's because there's more and more mysterious conditions and more injuries. So it's a perfect storm now combined with our terrible healthcare in the US I think I'm qualified to say that I used to work for a Blue Cross Blue Shield um, strategy department, and it's out of control. We're just, everybody's trying to make money in different ways, and now our healthcare costs are tremendous, and the more MRIs we get, and the more drugs that are prescribed, the harder it is to figure out what's actually the cause of things like pain, or cardiovascular disease, or cancer. So when we get into talking about pain, we're not gonna talk about these three things, uh, and that's because these three are basically healthy eating. So this isn't to say that gluten is bad, it's just people who tend to eat a lot of uh, flour as the main portion of their diet tend to have more pain. The same with um, sugar and vegetable oil. Those are not inherently bad, but there's different mechanisms why those are linked to pain. Uh, gluten, for example, other than people that have celiac disease, there's also possible links with people who have non-celiac um, gluten sensitivity uh, with sugar. There's a strong link for some conditions like frozen shoulder. And for cheap vegetable oils, the more your diet is based on cheap oils that oxidize and go rancid within your body easily, uh, the more likely it is that you'll have uh, pain issues that don't go away because a lot of your adipose tissue then is easily oxidized. And when your body needs to create inflammation, then it starts pulling from those fats that are easily oxidized, which is not a good environment to have if you're trying to curb an injury. What we are gonna talk about is these kind of distant factors that all wrap around a pain. And I'll let you choose, because there's not enough time to go over all the science for all of these. So the options are the gut, the brain, the body, body tissue, like joints and muscle, um, and things not related to any of those. So raise your hand if you want to focus on the gut. OK. Uh, what about the brain? OK. And the body. Okay, so let's say, oh, and things that aren't related to any of those, so kind of wacky therapies. One, okay, so let's say uh, we're gonna focus on the gut and the brain. And if you have questions about the other ones, just ask me afterwards. So the gut microbiome is hot. It's really easy to get research funding right now, but people also throw out a lot of claims, like take a lot of probiotics, or don't take any probiotics, eat a lot of fiber, don't eat any fiber, um, get your gut microbiome tested, or gut mi microbiome testing is useless. Uh, but that all ignores important factors about how we're adults and we're not kids with empty microbiomes. So when you take a probiotic, you're not like, this is my girlfriend's nephew uh, when he was getting his first haircut at age six. He's different than we are because he had an empty microbiome when he was born. And then when you have a vaginal birth, then you collect bacteria and that seeds your intestine. Uh, breast milk can seed your intestine. Some babies that are only formula fed uh, have an essentially empty microbiome, and then when they start eating, then the food they eat is much more important than the food we eat, because once you get that bacteria in there, it's hard to eradicate it. So it's different for babies, it's different for us, it's also different for us uh, de uh, depending on when we were born. So if you were born in the 70s or 80s, you more likely played outside, you're less likely to have used uh, antibacterial hand wash, and you're also less likely to have allergies. Uh, kids born nowadays don't have any of those advantages. Um, and another detriment of modern times is that kids nowadays are also on iPads a lot. And that doesn't seem to be involved in the microbiome or with pain, but it's probably one of the more central issues with chronic pain and the microbiome. And the issue is that when you wake up in the morning and what do people do when they wake up? Do you pick up your phone or do you, no? Yeah? So when you pick up your phone, that's not necessarily bad, but if you wake up and you pick up your iPad and you're two and a half, that's bad. So my girlfriend's nephew has an iPad now. He's two and a half. So uh, 
that's unfortunate, because look, he's really cute. Um, and it makes him less cute when he's just like angry birds all day, every day. <laughs> and just like gut microbiomes, babies' brains are also conditioned. When you have that dopamine rush from clicking or clicking the red notification on Facebook or whatever, then you're accustomed to getting essentially what you want, when you want. And if you can't get it, then you turn to something else like news or whatever else, because there's an infinite number of things on the internet. And pain, like I referred to before, is not in your joint. Pain is in your brain. You can easily get rid of pain using invasive nervous system therapies, and you can also refer pain to different areas. You can make your brain think that the pain that's in your knee is in your other knee. So the pain might have stemmed from an area, but the pain now resides in your brain. And there's an image of the body in your brain, and this image called the homunculus changes over, over time. So functional magnetic, um, functional MRIs show that if somebody has pain and then that pain goes from acute to chronic over the course of months, let's say the pain is in the wrist, then the homunculus in the brain, the image of the body that your brain has of yourself, the image of the wrist will be, you know, normal size. And then six months later when the pain is chronic, your wrist will be like this big in the image. And that's because the brain is what controls the pain, and the brain is where all of that resides, and the brain is what you have to attack. Now, luckily, you don't have to go right in the brain. You can approach uh, brain-related therapies through things we'll talk about later, like meditation um, and certain supplements, but you can also approach it from the perspective of the gut, because the gut and the brain have the strongest connection, possibly of any two organs in the body that aren't in close proximity. So nowadays, the standard American diet contains a lot of acellular carbohydrate. Acellular means without cells. Okay, but what it really means is when you eat plants or animals, you're eating cells. When you eat spinach, you're eating that plant's spinach cells. When you eat an animal, you're eating that animal's cells that are rich in, you know, myoglobin or whatever, which makes it red. Um, when you're eating a sandwich, when you're eating a cookie, you're eating an acellular carbohydrate. That carbohydrate is disassociated from the cell. It's just carbohydrate. So that is not, again, necessarily bad, but when that makes up most of your diet, then it is bad. The average American eats 130 pounds of wheat flour a year, which is a lot. And most people who eat that much don't realize it, and that also makes up one of the two or three uh, greatest sources of calories. And then when you combine that wheat with sugar or with salt, then you get fancy snacks, and they taste great. So, like a pretzel up there um, is a wheat concoction. And gluten gets a lot of the blame for wheat, but an equal or greater amount of the blame should be because wheat is one of the easiest um, grains to process down into tasty things. The grain in and of itself does not taste good. But when you process it down, then you can combine the wheat with sugar, uh, make a curly cue, and bake it up real hot, and you have a really great pretzel. And then when you get addicted to that kind of thing, not addiction as in heroin or whatever, those memes about sugar is heroin, you know, they're just memes. But you can definitely like pretzels a lot, and you can like cookies a lot, and you like them more and more as you get larger because brain signaling is kind of thrown off. And then when you go down that list, then eventually you get to the point where, let's say a cheeseburger, banana, or apple. Cheeseburger has meat in it. You can only process meat so much. You can mince it down and make a hamburger. You can make that patty. But you're not going to combine that patty with sugar and twist it into something. So you're only going to be able to eat so much meat. So even if you ate a 100% meat diet, it's very unlikely that you will get obese because it's satiating from the protein. If you ate a 100% plant-based diet, you're not as likely to become obese because the second satiating nutrient is in their fiber. It's only when you get to acellular carbohydrate then that's bad for obesity, and it's also bad for our gut. Because when we eat food that's acellular and it goes into our gut, then the bacteria that was seeded in you when you were a baby, you're probably eating fairly healthy food. You're eating, you know, applesauce or rice puffs or whatever babies eat. So, you know, that is in your intestine. The bacteria, the small number that are in there, start to eat that and they multiply. But then when you eat more and more acellular carbohydrate when you're older, then you eat the food, goes down into your uh, stomach through your small intestine, and when you get a lot of that acellular carbohydrate, what happens is, even if you ate like 
two apples and a whole watermelon, you could not get as much carbohydrate in your small intestine at one time as eating a ton of cookies. And that's because the ton of cookies will just sit there. There's not fiber to make it go through quicker. There's not a signal to the um, sphincter between your small and large intestine to signal that you need to pass this food through and extract nutrients. You just get this big chunk of acellular carbohydrate. And when you have a lot of acellular carbohydrate here, then the bacteria that are normally in your colon, they want to go up and eat that carbohydrate. And the more they migrate up to where they shouldn't be, the more you get digestive issues because now they're eating things they shouldn't even have access to, and you get gas, and you get diarrhea, and you get constipation. And when that happens, when your gut isn't healthy, your brain's not healthy, because there's a direct nerve, one of the largest nerves in the body, that links the gut to your brain, and it's not just that you have a, a tummy ache and you're not happy about it, there's actually a direct connection between what's going on in your brain. So that's why our gut can affect our brain, and because our brain is where pain is housed, they're all linked together. And then this leads to a vicious cycle. So when you get to the point where your pain never, never goes away, then you start taking opioids. Opioids slow transit of food down your gut. So when I was talking about all of that acellular carbo carbohydrate kind of gathering in the small intestine, what happens when it's not moving even as quickly as it did before and it's just sitting there? The bacteria have more time to eat it. So the more opioids, the more constipation, the more time for bacteria to eat, the more gas, the more depression, the more pain. And that cycle also leads to less activity and higher body weight. So one of the solutions is eating more plant food because the more plant foods you eat that kind of look like plants, you know, uh, wheat is a plant, so technically that pretzel is derived from a plant, but anything that kind of looks like a plant probably still has some cells in it. And when you eat those plants, then you feed certain types of bacteria such as those listed there. So you might say, just eat more plants. That's the way to help your gut and then help your brain and then help your pain. There's wrinkles in that. It's usually good to eat more plants or all plants, but there's issues with what type of bacteria you're feeding. If you're a healthy person and you eat more plants, great. If you're a sick person and you eat more plants, not always great, depending on what type of plants you eat. So gut microbiome research is complicated because of issues like uh, those charts right there. At the top, uh, those two uh, pie charts are patients who have conditions, type 2 diabetes and inflammatory bowel disorders. So uh, that's Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, which are uh, conditions where you have a lot of actual gut damage and you have to control those often with biologic medications. So the bottom is a comparison to healthy people. And what I notice is that there's no way to predict the change from the healthy to the sick people. It's not like the yellow chunks are large at the bottom and then at the top they're small. No, if you look at type 2 diabetes, the yellow chunk is uh, even bigger for people who have type 2 diabetes. Uh, what about the red chunk? You know, the red chunk is large in people who have in inflammatory bowel disorders, but it's not large in people who have diabetes. In fact, it's the same as their healthy controls. So the issue is that different types of bacteria eat different types of food. So some people who eat a lot of meat and a small amount of plants are completely healthy, but some people who eat a large amount of meat and small amounts of plants are not healthy. And they say, you know, is it possible that my gout, which is traditionally linked to high meat diets, or my knee uh, arthritis is linked to meat? We don't know for sure, but what we do know is that uh, just in the past five or 10 years, researchers have found more bacteria in our guts that eat amino acids. So that wasn't even known at all before. It was assumed that plants ate fiber and certain carbohydrates, and that was it. Now it turns out they can eat amino acids too. So basically, we don't know what they're doing in there. We have no idea. There's so many different types of species of bacteria that it's going to take many years of research before we classify who, uh, which does what and what you, we should eat based on that. That means don't buy a health service that tests your gut bacteria with the promise that they're going to tell you what to eat. The way to figure out what to eat and how it affects your gut and how it affects your pain is an elimination diet. There's no other way to do it. For some people, eating a lot of uh, certain types of protein, like let's say the major types are whey, casein, soy, pea, rice. For some people, whey protein 
is great, actually, for most people. For some people, casein or complete milk protein screws up their gut. And I'll get to why later, but uh, the reasons for those were only found in the last basically two years. For some people, soy protein is great. For some people, isolated soy protein makes them feel bad. We don't actually know why. There's only theoretical reasons. There haven't been randomized trials done. So you have to stop for a couple of weeks, have a limited diet to what you know you can handle, and then introduce foods or supplements back in. So when we talk about probiotics, then, like I said, it's always new research. Uh, these are extremely new studies that are usually in small sample sizes, which means it's not as reliable as some other topic areas. So uh, not last week, but last year, there was a big study on rheumatoid arthritis in mice that found that a certain probiotic uh, eliminated about 65% of uh, pain in rheumatoid arthritis patients, which is amazing because for most people with rheumatoid arthritis, when they have a flare, there's no way around it other than prednisone. So prednisone uh, makes you bloated. Prednisone is not good for joint tissue. Um, and prednisone is just something that people with disease don't want to take. A probiotic should be an easy fix, but the trial was in mice who don't have a microbiome. So it's comparing mice who have no bacteria at all in their intestine with mice who took this probiotic. So that was step one of a research process that's probably going to take five years. A mouse without a microbiome, a mouse with a microbiome, a human study in a pilot trial with five people, then a randomized trial, then a large randomized trial. So this is going to take a long time. So instead of just looking at research, let's take a step back and look at the forest instead of the trees. Why is it that kids have more allergies nowadays? People generally know that there's an issue with keeping kids inside and not having them play in the dirt um, and kind of suboptimal diets. And that stems back to something called the hygiene hypothesis. In most developed countries, there's higher rates of autoimmune disease every year. In less developed countries, there's essentially no autoimmune disease, at least in people that don't have higher incomes. And that's not because it's not diagnosed. When you uh, test for autoimmune disease, there just isn't any. And they might be sick in many other ways, but they don't have autoimmune, autoimmune disease. And that's because, researchers hypothesize, uh, our guts are essentially either sterile or they're sterile plus a lot of bacteria overgrowth. Not a lot of people have healthy balances of bacteria. And that's because, first of all, we don't eat a lot of uh, varieties of plants. Oh, we'll eat like the same thing every day. Like, oh, you know, I eat an apple a day and I eat baby carrots, so that should be enough. No, usually humans, we eat a lot of different plants. And the second reason is that we don't get parasites. So I'm not saying you should eat parasites like, you know, tapeworm and stuff. But what I am saying is that we already have the setback built into us. People in lesser developed countries will almost always have some kind of parasite at some point in their life. And that can kill you. But what it can also do is if it doesn't kill you, or if it's just a minor parasite, then it readies your immune system. It resides in your gut. It tells your immune system that it needs to be on alert, but only on a small amount of alert. And then the parasite potentially is killed by your immune system. And then later on in your life, if something happens, like if you have uh, some kind of hole in your intestine and something leaks through, your immune system will be like, well, I was on low alert before, I remember that because I have some cells from that point still stored in my lymph nodes. So I should not go crazy reacting to this food protein that leaked through. I should instead maintain a low level of alertness. So instead of going from 0 to 60 and developing autoimmune conditions, you go from 0 to 10 and eliminate you know, that rogue protein or whatever, and then you go back to business as normal. We don't have that because we don't have parasites. So the only thing we can do right now is eat a greater diversity of food that feeds our microbiome. And we can also take probiotics. So if you take probiotics, then step one should be taking a very small amount uh, because this whole kind of uh, take 10 billion or 50 billion colony forming units, it's a weird arms race that's developed in the supplement industry the past five or 10 years. And I think at some point it's gonna be like, you know, take three of these pills in the morning and three at night and then, you know, titrate up. But that's insane because we already have bacteria there. We don't want to necessarily introduce a huge amount of strange bacteria because the bacteria there are already going about their business. And let's say, as an analogy, that's like a party. And if you introduce a lot of new bacteria in, it might work out fine. You know, if cool people come to your party, totally fine. If it's a party where, you know, it's all guys, it's not going well, you introduce a few females, maybe it's going better. But let's say it's a bunch of drunk guys. 
And then you're like, well, why don't I take a lot of probiotics? So you introduce a lot of new drunk guys. And you're like, hey, this, this isn't working. Let me try a different probiotic. Can you take that? But that's a bunch of cops. So now you have a very strange situation going on. You're like, well, try probiotics. Seemed to work and then didn't work. I don't know what's going on. Of course you don't know what's going on. Researchers don't know what's going on. What you do is, if you're healthy, fine. Take one pill of 10 billion CFUs. If you're not healthy, meaning you have gut issues. People with gut issues, you know who you are because it's like everybody else and you. Uh, you'll go out to eat and you'll be like, well, I can't eat that because, you know, it gives me whatever and people make fun of you. Well, there's a lot of people with gut issues and those people should not take large amounts of probiotics because they could create a crazy bad party. Instead, if you want to take probiotics, take one that's been extensively studied. There's only really three or four. Um, take the capsule, open it up, sprinkle like one fifth of it into water and take it um, along with the meal. And then if it goes well, take a little bit more and titrate up over the course of a week or two. And then you won't introduce strange stuff into a situation that's probably already strange. Another issue with the gut is when you eat foods, um, so not bacteria, but when you eat foods, then certain people feel bad depending on what types of food they eat. So does anybody feel bad when they eat fried food? Like acutely? Okay, so uh, I started nutrition research or my nutrition research career about 15 years ago and somebody asked me one time, uh, you know, whenever I eat wings or whenever I eat like fried chips, then I don't feel great. Uh, and I would say it's psychological because you can't have an immediate reaction to the meat in the chicken wing or to the oil because it's just, you know, it's fat. It might be a little bit oxidized, but it's just fat. That was short-sighted because when you eat a lot of fat at one time, especially certain types of fat, then that enables parts of broken down and dead bacteria to cross through your intestine. So if you eat a lot of, let's say, plant food, if you eat a big salad, that's not going to cause dead bacteria or dead bacterial parts to go through your intestine um, unless you have bad celiac disease and you have uh, gut perforations or something. But if you eat a ton of fat, like a lot of chicken wings, it's possible that if you had some remnants in there, all that fat is going to enable the gut bacteria pieces to hitch a ride. And when it hitches a ride across the intestine, that can cause issues. Because the reason there's pain that never goes away is either something to do with the brain or something to do with the joint that relates to the brain. And one of those is having something that the joint reacts to that is no longer the injury because the injury was probably resolved or resolved as much as it could be up to you know, two to four weeks after the original injury. But if that little bit of dead bacteria goes through your intestine and then your bloodstream and ends up you know, in your wrist, your immune system can react to that. And because we've never had parasites, because we don't have good gut bacterial balance, you can easily go from zero to 60. And then if you comfort yourself by eating more wings, a lot of ice cream, a lot of acellular carbohydrate, the situation just gets worse and worse. So there's a combination of unhealthy food, acellular carbohydrate, a ton of fat, uh, things that don't have fiber, nutrients that go together to perpetuate pain. And then there's another issue, which is something called NEU5GC. Uh, has anybody heard of this? One, okay. Oh yeah, you're a nutrition researcher, you don't count. So, uh, NEU5GC is found in meat, and does anybody not eat meat? One, two, three. Okay, there's three people in the audience that don't have NEU5GC in their blood. It sounds scary, right? NEU5GC, it's an acronym that doesn't seem to mean anything, but don't, don't freak out, but NEU5GC is only in red meat. So if you love red meat, you probably have a lot of NEU5GC in your body. This doesn't mean that you're going to be unhealthy or you're going to die. But what it does mean is when you eat um, animals, then you're eating, is this a laser? No. Oh, yeah. So when you eat a pig or when you eat a cow or what is that, a lamb? Okay, something. That's kind of sad. Let's say cow or pig. And you're eating these animals, then you're eating animal tissue and we're animals. You know, dogs are animals, cats are animals. Just because you're a farm animal that gets bred to be eaten doesn't mean you're different than a human. You're flesh. 
And just because we're not sensitized to it doesn't mean we shouldn't be aware that we're eating something that's like ourselves. And what's in our tissue? There's, um, you know, protein, because we work out. Our muscle is largely protein and water. Uh, there's stuff that makes it red, iron. And there's also cells, like I talked about before. And an uh, animal cell is a cell wall, or there's a cell membrane, and then the reason why immune systems react to certain things is in the body is because the cell membrane is coated with carbohydrate. And it's actually sugar. It's not like the sugar you eat goes to the cell, but uh, we use sugars for a lot of things, like our immune system and messaging and stuff. And one of the things is coating our cells for signaling. So when you coat your cells, then there's these strings of carbohydrates that go out in all animals, and all those strings are capped with one of several what's called sialic acids. And humans were like pigs and like cattle a long time ago, two million years ago, and then our, our human predecessors. And then at a certain point, we changed. We lost our ability to make the cap, the sialic acid, and that cap is NEU5GC. So suddenly, we went from not being able to make NEU5GC um, to making something else called NEU5AC. And they think that provided us possibly with some kind of uh, resistance to some infection at that point because that coding interacts with the immune system. So, you know, humans didn't think about it until the past five or 10 years, and there started to be more research because you can do more magnification of what's going on at the cell level. And what they found is that humans have NEU5AC. When we eat NEU5GC, then, uh, then it goes into our intestine. Okay, forget the laser. It goes into our intestine, and in our intestine, the bacteria recognize it because the bacteria are living. They know NEU5GC from AC, but they usually can't do much. But let's say that you have gut issues or part of that bacteria translocated through the intestine. Some of that NEU5GC that you ate can go into your bloodstream. And for a long time, researchers thought, no big deal, because a lot of people have eaten a lot of red meat for a lot of years and not gotten sick, which is true. If you eat red meat, that doesn't mean that you're going to have health issues. But if there's a perfect storm of whatever, gut issues, we don't really understand all the factors, and you eat a lot of red meat, that NEU5GC will go into your body, and your immune system recognizes NEU5AC as self. And NEU5GC and those molecules looks just like AC. It just has one different tiny part in red. So when our immune system sees that, it's like, I don't know what this is. Is it our NEU5AC? Maybe, maybe not. Let's kill it just in case. So if you kill that NEU5GC and you kill it near your wrist tissue or near your nervous tissue, and then you keep eating it and your immune system keeps killing it, you've got issues. Then you develop a sensitivity. So that took about two years of research. And then just last year, what researchers found is people who have thyroid conditions, either Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, or thyroid tumors, have around 30 times higher levels of NEU5GC than humans who do not have those conditions. Vegans and vegetarians have infinitesimally low levels, depending on when or if they eat meat. But having high levels of NU5GC, other than that, is not necessarily linked to health conditions, either because we don't know or because it just isn't. So that was the extent of research up until there was the first trial. Unfortunately, it was a rodent trial. They fed um, uh, mice a diet rich in NU5GC and another diet that was exactly the same without NU5GC. And the cancer rates were around 0 to 2% in the group without and around 15 to 20% with. So that might make it seem like don't eat red meat. Again, there's another wrinkle in there because in order to elicit an effect in a, in a trial like that, you have to overfeed. Otherwise, you're going to have to run like a 30-year study with an animal. And people want results now. So they overfeed, and then they see cancer rates. So we know if you eat an all red meat diet, you probably have a higher risk of those conditions. But any other amount, we don't really know. But if you have a history or a family history of thyroid conditions, I would say it's definitely something to watch out for. And it, we're really talking about red meat here. Um, white meat and fish is different. Uh, dairy products are different. There is some NEU5GC in uh, processed meat and cheese, but really like steak, hamburger, that's the king of NEU5GC. Um, fish, all plants, 
don't have any, any, any NEU5GC because the fish have a different type of coating, carbohydrate coating, and plants don't have a coating. So um, when we eat meat, then humans are, were able to use their big brain to go hunting and get the meat. And when we gathered, when we gathered plants, then we would have to test, you know, is this mushroom going to kill me? I'm not sure. You find out over the course of thousands of years what's healthy or not. We're at the point now where the food, the plant food that is, uh, raises crops, we know that's healthy because we wouldn't be growing it otherwise, at least if you eat it as is. If you grow monoculture, soy, or wheat or something, or corn, that's not necessarily healthy. Uh, but what we didn't know for a long time is what factors in meat, once we eat it, might be bad because the saturated fat in meat, there's no connection to heart disease if you eat at any moderate, even slightly high amounts. Um, cholesterol, it's not linked to the cholesterol in our blood. It's really only these minor weird things if you eat it in large amounts that might be linked to poor health. So speaking of red meat and iron, by the way, that's my old cat, Chloe. Um, and the picture's there because that's a cast iron pan. So does anybody use cast iron at home? So um, cast iron is called cast iron because it has a lot of iron. And you can get a lot of iron in your diet by cooking in cast iron. And when you get a lot of iron, it's usually uh, good for iron deficiency, but it can also be bad for certain reasons. So when I said everybody's gut microbiomes were different, then there's a few different ways. One is some people have very healthy balances of bacteria. Some people don't. Um, some people don't have much bacteria at all because like if you have a colonoscopy, that washes out a good 60% of your bacteria. Um, if you get colonics, which probably is not a good idea to get, that washes out almost 100%. But people have different gut microbiomes, and people also process different foods differently. So iron, when you get it from plants, not highly bioavailable. So if you're a vegan or vegetarian, you have to watch out for iron, especially if you're female. If you're male and you eat a lot of meat, you have to watch out for the opposite, because one in, let's say, 20 people of Northern European ancestry have hemochromatosis. So they build up iron stores at a much quicker level. It doesn't seem like a bad thing until you realize what iron is. Iron is the thing in blood that carries oxygen. And the way it's able to carry oxygen is because it's easily um, oxidized. And things that are easily oxidized, like you know, an oil that goes rancid and smells bad, are not good in the body because the body is very warm. In fact, it's 98.6 degrees. So it's much warmer than you would encounter in normal life. And when things get oxidized, like uh, fats from adipose tissue or iron, that creates a possible highly inflammatory situation. And if not inflammation, at least poor signaling. And signaling involving the nervous system has to be pristine in order to avoid things like chronic pain. So that means if you eat a lot of meat, and basically you're white, uh, because if you're not white, your chances of hemochromatosis are a lot lower, uh, get your iron tested, you know, convince your doctor to order it, it'll be essentially free for you. And if you have joint issues, definitely get your minerals tested. Because there's links between gout, and certain minerals. There's links between rheumatoid arthritis and certain minerals. And because iron is easily oxidized, although it hasn't been researched, I have a hunch that people who eat a ton of iron every day tend to have higher amount, uh, incidence of pain conditions. Um, so milk is one other uh, kind of public health issue. You know, is, is milk healthy or not? Is it inflammatory? That's not actually the problem. The problem is not whether the fat in milk causes inflammation or whether the hormones cause inflammation. The problem is probably the casein. So who drinks milk? Um, does anybody drink A2 milk? No. Um, it's highly likely that if I gave this talk in Europe, most people would say if they knew what A2 milk is that they do drink A2 milk. What it is is uh, around 5,000 years ago, most cows were producing casein of the A1 sort, or A, the, uh, of the A2 sort. And, you know, it just looks like a cow and it's normal looking milk. The difference is that the casein, the whey and casein, curds and whey, um, the casein was of a slightly different structure. So then there was a mutation at a certain point, And then the A1 cow was the result of that. And the A1 cow was not special. Um, it wasn't like an X-Man. It didn't do anything cool. What it did do is it produced more milk and it got fatter. So farmers started raising more A1 cows. The issue with A1, or, um, the issue with A1 cow's milk is that they produce a type of casein that causes this molecule to be made, BCM7, beta casomorphin 7. And that's what can cause inflammation. 
So people will say, I feel mucusy when I eat dairy or whatever, or uh, you know, I get the runs or something. Often it's because they react to the casein in the milk. It's not the fat, it's not the fact that you know, it's milk, it's this protein. And this was just shown recently because uh, there was an expensive study where researchers fed a smart pill to see exactly what was going on when people drank milk, and you can see the inflammation from milk. Unfortunately, in the US, 99.9% .9 of people who drink milk, um, it's not the kind of milk that you would want. You really have to go to each coast. Luckily, right now we're in LA, you're more likely to encounter A2 milk, um, but you have to search for it. So if you're not able to find it and you feel like you might have reaction to milk, I would say you know, the obvious way to stop that is test stopping milk. But you have to do it for at least two to four weeks because things don't happen instantaneously when it comes to gut reactions. The gut has to repopulate, gut lining has to regenerate, and all that kind of thing. Um, I don't have much time left, so I'm going to skip this uh, and talk about wheat. So does anybody have celiac? Uh, does anybody have wheat sensitivity? OK, gluten. So uh, there's a lot of different types of possible reactions to wheat. And when do you have joint pain issues? So do you, uh, it's hard because you wouldn't know, but do you suspect a connection to wheat or other things that you eat? So it's easy to be dismissive of gluten because uh, gluten, like sugar and like fat in the 80s, is a hot button issue. If you want to get uh, you know, your post or your ad or whatever to sell well, you say, hey, all those people who uh, have like gluten allergy, it's a stupid fad. It's like juice cleansing. Not true. So there's a lot of different ways you can have reactions to something like gluten. And one of them, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, is strange because we're still in the formative stages of research. Some people who eat uh, gluten-containing products will have a reaction, a little bit of a reaction to gluten, but not in the next 24 hours. And they'll also have an immediate reaction to something called FODMAPs. Has anybody heard of FODMAPs? So FODMAPs are types of carbohydrates that uh, certain bacteria in some people's bodies uh, can't get enough of. And that's OK if your gut's healthy, but if you have a lot of bacteria in your small intestine and not in your large, and it's eating stuff it shouldn't, when you eat FODMAPs, suddenly you're eating something that, the, that pulls in water because the bacteria is eating so much of it at one point. And then for things like onions and garlic, which are the main FODMAPs, you feel terrible. And often you can have joint pain. And the question is, is it from the onion, garlic kind of stuff? Is it from the gluten? Is it from other things in the wheat? We don't know. But there's a clear connection of pain. So when there's a clear connection of pain, then you have to look at the next step, which is what happens in the brain. Um, and I already covered what happens with probiotics. Uh, but then, real quickly, I have to cover what happens when you eat a healthy or unhealthy diet, and then you don't get enough sleep. So does anybody get under six hours of sleep? OK, so a lot of people. And uh, is that not enough? Or you guys are happy with six? So in studies where you give people blue light blocking glasses, amber glasses at night, uh, what happens is they produce melatonin naturally a lot earlier. Even if you're watching TV or reading a really bright iPad, the amber glass will block enough of the blue light that tricks your brain into producing melatonin. Melatonin is an antioxidant independently. Melatonin also leads to smoother sleep cycles, less interrupted sleep. When you wake up, you're kind of more satiated. Your uh, circadian rhythm runs more smoothly. And when I mention glucosamine, fish oil, and all that kind of stuff, the reason why I dismiss it is because it's very rare for somebody who's had a lot of pain to take glucosamine and chondroitin and feel better, magically. Uh, there's a lot of fake Amazon reviews, but meta-analyses have shown a very weak connection. But in pilot trials where you give people enough sleep, where you force them to sleep enough and have good sleep hygiene, that is stronger than any medication that's ever been studied for pain, regardless of condition. So when your clients ask you about, does this work for pain, does this work for pain, does this work for pain, if they're at all intellectually curious, bring up things like the gut and sleep, because it doesn't matter how much you buy on Amazon, that's not going to solve your pain issues if it's caused by chronic sleep deficiency or by gut microbiome unbalance. And I think that's time. <laughs>